Rights Lecture. Unfortunately, Kate Coley, who represents the ARA, will not be able to join us tonight due to a family funeral. And we send her our thoughts this evening. And we are so happy to be back here at Kyle Morrow and seeing each other in person after over a year and a half of Zoom. However, that pesky virus is still with us, with us, so we ask you to please wear a mask during the lecture portion of the evening. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Kelsey Norman, author of Reluctant Reception, Refugees, Migration, and Governance in the Middle East and North Africa. But I will introduce her further in a moment. But first, a message from our sponsor. Friends of Fondra Library is delighted to present tonight's event with the Association of Rice Alumni. And if you would like to support events like this by joining our library membership program, please visit library.rice.edu or pick up a membership form right over there on the table with badges. Now I am delighted to introduce Dr. Kelsey Norman. Kelsey has a number of roles on the Rice campus, serving as a fellow for the Middle East at the Rice University's Baker Institute and as a director of the Women's Rights, Human's Rights, and Refugees Program. Kelsey earned her PhD in political science at the University of California, Irving in 2017. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for European Studies at the University of British Columbia and also at the C. Chow Khan Center for International Security and Diplomacy at the Joseph Corbell School for International Studies at the University of Denver before joining Rice University. You can read more of her work in academic journals such as the European Journal of International Relations and the International Studies Review, or a little more accessible in popular outlets such as the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, and the Atlantic Monthly. Her new book is called Reluctant Reception, Refugees, Migration, and Governance in the Middle East and North Africa and it considers various ways host countries treat migrants and refugees, a very timely topic for today. She draws on over 130 interviews with government officials, refugees, and many others to study the various types of engagement and how these strategies have changed over time. We will have a question and answer session and a book giveaway after her presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kelsey Morgan. Uh, thank you so much, Virginia, uh, for that introduction. And thank you so much um, to the Friends of Fondren Library for having me here tonight. It's an honor uh, to be the speaker at your first in-person event. Uh, how exciting. Um, so today, uh, I hope you'll allow me, I'm going to talk a bit about my book um, and some of the major arguments and um, topics that I address in it, but I'm also going to connect it to some more recent events um, within our own uh, geographical realm in the United States uh, as it pertains to migration and refugees. So we'll, we'll, we'll walk our way through all this. So um, the way I often talk, first uh, begin talking about this book um, is with this image, um, which you know is amongst many like it. But basically, I think when we when we consider migration, when we consider refugees, we're so often bombarded by images like this one. So this is depict, this is from 2015, at sort of the height of Europe's um, so-called refugee crisis. So this was these are individuals attempting to cross between uh, Turkey and and. Greek islands, which is only about four miles, but of course was a very dangerous journey for many. Um, and I think because we often so many are, are bombarded with images like this one that depict migratory journeys, um, we usually think about migration in those terms. So we usually think about migration as occurring from countries of the global south, a country like Turkey, to countries of the global north, a country like Greece, which is part of the European Union. Or you know, in our own uh, hemisphere, we might think about, if we think about migration, if we think about refugees, we'll probably often think about our southern border with Mexico, right? And asylum seekers or migrants that are kind of stuck along 
along that border or maybe have just crossed into the United States. But so I think what, what these types of images have led us to think about migration misses a big part of the picture. So if we think about 2015, that, that image we just saw, uh, and we think about Syrian refugees in particular, which was the largest group of, of individuals that were arriving in Europe during that time period, um, you can see from this infographic, I hope, the, the smaller circles in green, those are the number of, of asylum applications that were filed by Syrian nationals during that crisis period, so from sort of mid-2015 until early 2016. But you can see that they're eclipsed by these much larger red circles that are the number of Syrian nationals who were living in countries that neighbor Syria, uh, that, that neighbor uh, Syria, including, in this, as you can see here, Turkey, uh, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and some like Egypt. So these are developing countries, right? These are countries of the global south. And this speaks to a larger trend. So if you look at the, the graph on the left, this is the number of international migrants, the sort of stock of international migrants worldwide in 2015. So you can see that it is true that a slight majority of migrants end up living in countries of the global north, countries like those of Europe or in North America or maybe Australia. But it's almost half of the world's migrants that live in countries of the global south, right, 42%. And that percentage might be even bigger now because south to south migration is growing more rapidly than south to north migration. And this is much more pronounced if you look at the graph on the right, so the number of global refugees worldwide, um, again in 2015. So you can see that it's almost 86% of the world's refugees that live in countries of the global south. So developing countries, countries like those that neighbor Syria, or maybe Kenya, or Mexico, or Central America, right? These are the countries that predominantly host refugees. And so what I talk about in the book is why is it that we don't really think about countries of the global south as, as host countries, as countries that host migrants and refugees. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about those pictures that we might see in the media, I'm also talking about um, policy uh, literature as well as academic literature. So that was something I was hoping to address with this book, is this gap. We just don't think about countries of the global south as host states. So I think part of that has to do with a few assumptions. So the first is this assumed impermanence of migrants. Um, and refugees living in countries of the global south. So in the, in the case of migrants, this is because we usually think about countries of the global south as just transit countries, right? So people are coming from one country, passing through other developing countries, hoping to reach countries of the global north. But I think that misses the reality, as we saw from that other um, graph in the previous slide, almost half of the world's migrants live in countries of the global south. Um, in the case of refugees, we assume that people might have to flee their homeland, but once a crisis resolves itself, people will just go back home. But of course, we know that there are increasingly protracted refugee situations where it may not be possible to go home uh, so easily, or at least not for a long time. Um, there's also been a greater focus on camps uh, rather than urban spaces. So you can see this photo on, on the right is a picture of Zalkari Refugee Camp, which is one of the largest refugee camps in the world. Um, it's located in Jordan and hosts predominantly Syrian refugees. But even in Jordan, actually the majority of refugees live in urban spaces. And that's reflected globally. So more than half of the world's refugees, the majority, live in urban or at least sort of peri-urban spaces rather than camps. And I think this is important for the kinds of questions that I'm interested in, which is how do countries or governments respond to migrants and refugees in the global south? Because in a camp situation, it might be the case that you're not going to interact with um, host country nationals and also host country government authorities. Um, but in urban environments, that's not the case, right? You're definitely going interac to interact with uh, host country nationals, and you might also interact with host country government officials or authorities. And then lastly, there's been this sort of implicit assumption, especially in the academic literature, uh, that countries in the global south just don't have the capacity to engage with migrants and refugees, and therefore we shouldn't really consider how they might develop policies uh, towards migrants and refugees. And it might be the case that developing countries, you know, by virtue of that very name, don't necessarily have the same capacity as countries of the global north. They might have, you know, they might be less economically developed, they might have uh, somewhat weaker institutional capacity, but a big part of this book is arguing that it doesn't mean that they're not strategic when it comes to how they develop policies towards migrants and refugees. So, uh, the main question that I'm addressing in this book is how do global south countries respond to migrant refugee populations? And specifically, I'm looking at uh, countries, global south countries in the Middle East and North Africa. 
about this question. So um, I'll talk a little bit about terminology. I keep saying migrants and refugees, so maybe people are curious about that. I'll talk about the Mediterranean context, which is what I look at in this book. I'll talk then a little bit about how we can draw some parallels with what's going on in our own geographic context. And then I'll talk about some policy options we have for moving forward, or at least some, some ideas, maybe, about how to move forward from here. So just to cover this topic quickly, um, so the 1951 convention, which was established in the wake of World War II, established how we think about who qualifies for refugee status. Right? So you can see in this large text, what I've highlighted is basically someone who's fleeing their home country has to qualify for refugee status because they face five specific types of persecution. So it had to be persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social, uh, social group, or their political opinion. And when you think about it, that's, that's fairly narrow, right? It might have made sense in 1951, but it's uh, perhaps a little bit outdated in terms of the types of pressures that might force individuals to flee their home countries currently. Um, and an important aspect of this too is an individual has to be outside um, of the country of his or her nationality. So this, uh, someone who has not yet been able to escape their country, for example, not yet been able to escape Syria, they're going to be qualified as an, as an internally displaced person, right? They're not a refugee. So just in terms of accounting, sometimes we see statistics that really collapse those two categories. And then lastly, they have to be unable or only to fear, unwilling to return to their home country. So that's uh, sort of how someone might qualify for the status of a refugee. And again, it's grounded in this 1951 convention that then most states globally have adopted into their own domestic laws. Um, and then someone who's an asylum seeker, which is also a category of, of individual that I looked at in the book, is someone basically who is seeking refugee status but it hasn't yet been established. So they've, you know, in a country like those that I look at, country in the global south, they, it's someone who's arrived in another country from their own national country. Um, they might have learned about the UN, the United Nations Agency, the, specifically the UNHCR, and they might have approached them and begun the process of applying for refugee status, but they haven't yet qualified because there's a, a, a vetting process. That basically, someone has to qualify under those five reasons that we talked about. So a asylum seeker is someone who wants to become a refugee, but it hasn't yet been established. And then a migrant basically becomes this catch-all category for everyone else, right? Everyone who doesn't qualify under those other two categories. But the problem with this terminology and the way we think about it as these very black and white categories is that people can move between these different categories, right? Depending on the country that they're in, um, the way that they travel to that place, and if they move to another country, they might become a different category, um, and yet we're talking about the same person. And someone who feels that they can't return to their country, maybe someone who's fled because of climate change or because of you know, economic devastation after a war, they're not someone who's going to qualify for refugee status, and yet they might also feel like they're not able to return to their country. So they end up just getting categorized as a migrant, when in reality, maybe that, that distinction between the two is, is, quite a bit, is, is fairly blurry. So for that reason, I included all these individuals in my study. And it's also important to note that in the countries I was looking at, all these types of categories and people are living amongst each other, right? They're all sort of uh, using the same strategies to try and survive. So for me, it was important to, to include all of them. And just to also hammer this point home, we see a lot of confusion about this type of language being used in the media, right? So for example, uh, this headline from The Guardian back in 2015 says, refugee crisis escalates as migrants break through Hungarian border, right? So who are we talking about? We don't know because they haven't had the process, or they haven't had the chance to go through that whole process of determining whether they're a refugee. So the, the media is obviously, um, like many of us, confused about the distinction between these categories um, and uses them somewhat interchangeably. Okay, let's go on to um, sort of the heart of the book and some of the empirical um, material that I look at. So an important background um, that I talk about, about in the book is um, some, some of the changing politics within Europe and the changing policies that then impacted countries in the Middle East and North Africa in terms of migration and refugees. So as many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the Schengen Agreement. Um, this came into place in the 1980s and basically made it so that someone can travel, us as, as, as potentially American citizens, maybe some of you are not, but maybe some of you are, you, know, you can travel to, to France and then cross the border to Germany without ever going through a border check, right? That was the intention of opening up these internal borders within the European Union. But part of what that did, or part of what that necessitated, 
was to harden Europe's external borders. And this, this doesn't just mean you know, physical walls, um, but also bringing countries in its periphery sort of on board with its preferences for limiting not just um, regular migration and offering of visas to other countries, nationals from other countries, but also you know, really clamping down on irregular migration, which includes both migrants and asylum seekers. So the changing context in, some, in sort of the 1980s um, led to migrants and refugees having a much harder time reaching Europe and thereby having to stay for longer periods of time in the types of countries that I'm looking at. So specifically, my book looks at three countries from this sort of southern Mediterranean region. Um, Turkey, on, uh, in the, the sort of east, and then Egypt and Morocco. And what you can see from this graph, you know, it's actually a bit misleading because it makes it look like these migratory trajectories from different parts of, of uh, the global south just lead right up to Europe. But of course, in reality, these borders became very hard to cross, especially, you know, beginning in the 1980s, especially in the 1990s, and increasingly in the, into the 2000s, around the same time, we also see more pressure um, in terms of people having to leave their home countries um, from the Middle East, North Africa, and from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, leading to Morocco, Egypt, and Turkey hosting more and more uh, migrants and refugees for longer periods of time. So, how do they react? <laughs> So in my book, um, what I, I develop is a theory that I call strategic indifference. And what I mean by this is that on the books, it might look like basically my, uh, Morocco, Egypt, and Turkey didn't have any policy in place, right? They had basically no domestic laws pertaining to migration and refugees. Or if they had, you know, sort of outdated laws that they kind of haphazardly pieced together in order to handle this issue. But what I argue is that this sort of absence of formal law and policy was intentional. And, not, and declaring themselves strategically indifferent to the growing presence of migrants and refugees, what that did is it invited in these international organizations and these local development organizations or NGOs to, to manage the problem for them. So basically, uh, it became another form of development aid that helped Egypt, Morocco, and Turkey to not only you know, benefit migrants and refugees, but benefit local citizens, as well as gain, uh, offering sort of diplomatic um, Incentives for these three countries in that you know they look good to the international community. They're willing to host migrants and refugees even if they aren't engaging with them directly. But then what I also argue is that moving into the second decade of the 2000s, we see some interesting movement in terms of how these countries are responding to migrants and refugees. In the case of Egypt, uh, the policy became more repressive. In Morocco and Turkey, they adopted really big reforms related to migration and, and uh, asylum policy. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But to sort of further elaborate on what I mean by indifference and its impact for migrants and refugees that are, that are effectively stuck in these countries, is that um, the government you know, adopts this hands-off approach. It lets international organizations and NGOs come in and manage everything for, uh, for the state. And then migrants and refugees are kind of free, in a sense, to, to de facto integrate into the host country. Not integrate in the way that we think about it in the context of the US or maybe the context of Europe where there's you know, official government policies to offer language courses or to you know, offer employment training or access to the national health care system. Not in terms of that, but in terms of allowing them to more or less go about their lives and to come up with these different strategies for survival. So these are just some photos from the field work I did for this book. So I spent about 24 months when I added it all up between the three countries. Um, talking to government officials, talking to uh, international organizations and NGOs, and talking to individual migrants and refugees. And it became clear to me that, you know, migrants and refugees are living in the same neighborhoods that Moroccan citizens are, or that Turkish citizens are. So the picture on the left is Takabuo neighborhood in Rabat, which is known throughout, at least throughout Rabat, if not through the country, um, as like a, a neighborhood where migrants and refugees live. So of course the government also knows about this, right? But it's not deporting migrants, it's letting them more or less sort of do their thing. And in uh, Istanbul, if anyone's been, uh, this Aksaray neighborhood is very close to Sultan Ahmed, which is where you know, the, the Blue Mosque is and all the big tourist attractions, right? But it's just one neighborhood over, and you see an incredibly different scene. So lots of other, lots of multiculturalism, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's migrants who people might call you know, economic migrants, or it's asylum seekers, lots of Syrians, uh, when I was there in 2014 and 2015. Um, and it's thriving, and there's lots of informal business because people are you know, selling their wares along the streets. 
Uh, there's lots of potential smugglers <laughs> offering to potentially try and help people get to get to Europe. Um, but the presence of migrants and, and asylum seekers and, and refugees is very clear. And I think what this is important is, or, or part of why this is important is that it's somewhat of a corrective to this assumption that we have. Um, again, based on sort of you know, false, misleading images and other things um, from news media about what life is like for migrants and refugees in, in the global south. And this is not to say that people don't live in camps, that people don't struggle, that it's not a very difficult situation, but at least the individuals I was speaking with, you know, they're coming up with strategies for survival, right? So on the, in the photo of, on the left, this is um, two Syrian nationals working at a restaurant in Gaziantep. Um, in the middle image, this is, these are two uh, two co-nationals from the same West African country living in Rabat and um, you know, living with other nationals of other different countries, other migrants um, in that neighborhood that I showed you in the previous picture, um, Takudum. And then the photo on the right too, I think this, I'll, I'll just share a, a small anecdote um, that I think illustrates an important point. So this, this man, I opened each chapter of my book with sort of a, um, a small vignette. So this man, I, I, I give him a pseudonym of um, Amadou. So Amadou is from Senegal, and he's living in Rabat and selling, selling wares upon one of the main um, sort of thoroughfares in Rabat. And um, this man he's sort of hugging in this photo is a police officer, right? So it's not to say the authorities don't know about the presence of migrants and, and their participation in informal economies, um, but it's about knowing which police officers you can joke around with, as in this photo, and which police officers you need to be wary of. So just after this photo was taken, there was a very different security force, the sort of general security, that started ambling up the street towards us. And all the migrants, and also Moroccans that are informally selling goods along the street, quickly pack up their goods and go. You know, and they'll come back tomorrow and start doing the same thing. And no one was being arrested. But it was a show of force on behalf of the Moroccan general security that, you know, we're here now, you need to stop doing this activity. But so now there was someone who has to learn the difference between one police officer and this other type of police officer, and which, what are the red lines in, in this country um, that I cannot cross, right? Because nothing, again, nothing is written. This is all informal. Um, so migrants and refugees have come up with all sorts of strategies to survive in these countries where they're, you know, more or less living for 5, 10, 20 years. So even though we think about them as transit countries, in reality, people are having to sort of cobble together uh, their lives, usually with a little bit of support from international organizations or NGOs, but often via very informal mechanisms um, like this. Okay, so I won't go into this too much because it's, it's quite a, you know, uh, in-depth sort of theoretical argument of the book, but basically I talk about why we see these policy changes then in the three countries in 2014 and 2015. So in Egypt, we see a move towards more securitized policy, whereby the state is, the Egyptian government is willing to arrest people, arrest migrants, arrest refugees, detain them, and even deport them. We talk about how this is because at the time, domestic politics um, were having a huge impact on migration and refugee policy uh, at the time of the Egyptian military coup, and then this subsequent period um, of needing to sort of demonstrate the power of the state. And then in uh, Morocco and Turkey, we see an interesting change uh, towards more liberal policy. And I argue that this is because of organizing on behalf of domestic civil society groups, who basically took their arguments about why these countries should have better migration and asylum policies to the international arena, uh, to Geneva in the case of Morocco, and to the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Turkey, as well as Morocco and Turkey understanding that Migration was an important issue, and that they could, if they had a more liberal policy in place, that would um, basically lend them more international credibility, and they could use that to achieve sort of diplomatic and economic goals. So if that's a bit abstract, I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, or if, you're, if you want to read the book, I go into it uh, quite a bit there. But just to not bore you, <laughs> I'm going to then also talk about how, so most of the research I did for this book in terms of the field work was carried out between 2012 and 2015. But of course, in 2015, there was a big change. So as, as I said earlier, um, this is when we see the start of Europe's you know, crisis moment. So I don't know if you can see well, but basically the numbers in red are the number of arrivals via these different Mediterranean uh, migratory routes in 2014. And the central Mediterranean route had been the, the um, most uh, often used in 2014. But then we see a switch to the Eastern Mediterranean route because of a small policy change in the Balkan region that then meant that you know, 
I don't know how many times <laughs> this increase, so basically the numbers went from about 50,000 individuals arriving in 2014 to 885,000 individuals arriving in 2015 via that eastern migratory group. So this is the moment that Europe considers uh, this to be a crisis, right? And so if you remember, in August 20, uh, 2015, um, this is when we had the death of Eileen Kurdi. So he was a small, young uh, Syrian boy who, whose body washed up on the Turkish beach. And this photo was everywhere, right? In every single international newspaper. And this is, this is sort of Europe's moment of shame, when Europe realizes the repercussions of some of its migration policies, its external migration policies, and initially promises to make a difference, especially spearheaded by Angela Merkel at the time. So in, the, in September and in October, we see this promise from Europe that it's going to you know, uh, allow for the resettlement of all these uh, refugees, that everyone who has arrived is going to be allowed to stay, and that we're going to take more people in, we're going to distribute them across Europe, etc. But this quickly falls apart. Um, there's dissent, dissent from Slovakia first, and then uh, I think Austria backed out, and a number, a number of other countries as well. And then, in November 2015, um, we have the Paris bombings. So I'm sure you all recall um, these horrific bombings, but basically this is blamed on asylum, right? They blamed on the asylum seekers that had arrived earlier that year, and these, you know, allegedly loose borders that allowed for this security threat. And a lot of it was turned out not to be the case, so there was a Syrian passport that was planted at the site of one of the bombings, and initially then, you know, asylum seekers were blamed, even though it turned out to, to not be the case that, that um, uh, someone who had been seeking asylum was responsible. But nonetheless, this sort of damage was done. So instead of resolving its own internal issues over asylum, Europe instead looks to other countries, like those of the Middle East and North Africa, to kind of solve its asylum issues for them. So one of the ways it does this is with the 2015 Trust Fund for Africa. So this was a big pot of money that Europe established basically right after the Paris bombings in November 2015, <coughs> worth over six billion. And then basically this money is just being distributed across Africa, across North and Sub-Saharan Africa, for the purposes of trying to prevent migration at its origin, right? So offering basically development aid, economic aid, um, democracy promotion, with the hope that then people won't leave their homes in the first place. And actually, a new project of mine investigates, well, a lot of this money is being given to some countries with some serious human rights abuses, right? So what are the implications of this money on the ground? Um, not to mention that, at least from an economic understanding, we're pretty un unsure whether this uh, type of aid actually does have any impact on migration. It, it, it might even actually increase migration in the short to medium term because it provides more opportunities, basically, for people to leave. That was one tactic that, that Europe used. Um, another, oops, another tactic, if you recall, the, the 2016, it, it started in 2015, but was finalized in March 2016, the EU-Turkey deal. So this was basically a deal with Turkey whereby Syrians that arrived in Greece would be able to be sent back to Turkey, and allegedly in exchange for them, uh, Syrians in Turkish refugee camps being sent uh, to Europe. Um, that part hasn't really panned out, and it's, um, also, in conjunction with um, 6 billion euros that were offered to Turkey, uh, as well as the promise of restarting some of the accession negotiations that had fallen apart previously, or, and also access to, to the European Customs Union. Um, so Turkey was more than happy to agree to all of this, right? So um, this was then seen as a success because it stopped some of those numbers that had caused that you know, a huge jump in arrivals in 2015. And because it was a success, it was being replicated all across the Mediterranean. So in 2017, we have the deal with Libya, whereby Libya, which is in the midst of a civil war, um, is basically offered um, sort of equipment and other economic incentives if it will patrol the Mediterranean and return asylum seekers um, to Libya, where they're then living in detention facilities that are incredibly in incredibly poor condition, and um, even accusations of individuals in those detention facilities being sold into slavery. But nonetheless, <laughs> this helped stop further stop migration as well, right? Um, and this really had implications beyond just the Mediterranean, beyond just countries of North and and, uh, and uh, sort of the East, Eastern Mediterranean, and North Africa. Um, so this was a quote in, from 2016, so just after the EU-Turkey deal came into effect. This is a quote from the Kenyan Ministry of the Interior, who says, 
But so basically, the context is that um, there's a huge refugee camp in, in Kenya, the Dab refugee camp, one of, one, one of several, but the largest in the world. And Kenya was basically threatening to send home all of the uh, inhabitants of the refugee camp, primarily Somalis, back, sending them back to Somalia. And the Kenyan Ministry of the Interior says, well, governments across Europe and the Middle East have taken unprecedented efforts to limit refugee inflows into their country on the grounds of national security. Kenya cannot look aside and allow this threat to escalate any further. So basically, between the lines, what they're saying is, well, Europe has basically shirked off all of its responsibilities towards refugees, right? And at the same time as well, this is around the time that um, candidate Trump was talking about ending refugee resettlement to the United States as well, right? So across the global north, we see this sort of shirking of responsibility towards refugees and asylum seekers, and countries of the global south basically saying, well, like, we're not going to post people anymore either, right? Or at least using, or in some cases using this as sort of an extractive device to get what maybe Kenya wants at the time, probably increased aid, right? And it's not dissimilar from the, I'm sure you all are probably paying attention to the situation in Belarus right now, uh, the Belarusian government basically threatening Poland and the rest of the EU uh, by allowing migrants to continue onwards into the EU um, unless uh, Europe removes its sanctions on, on Belarus. Uh, so we see this sort of tactic being used again and again and increasingly since 2015. Okay, let me just talk, I hope I'm not going too, too long, I'll just talk briefly about the US, Mexico, and Central America situation. So in under the candidacy, or sorry, under the presidency of, of Donald Trump, we see a lot of the same tactics from the European Union's playbook uh, being utilized here as well. So one, of course, is uh, Donald Trump using uh, these state third country agreements, which in principle are very similar to the, to the EU deal with Turkey. So basically, um, these agreements were signed with Mexico, with Honduras, with Guatemala, with other countries of Central America, uh, meaning that this, the idea behind a safe third country agreement is that if someone, let's say from Guatemala, comes uh, and transits through Mexico in order to get to the United States and then comes here and applies for asylum, they can be sent back to Mexico because the US has a safe third country agreement in place with Mexico. Right? So it's basically asking other countries to be the, the hosts of asylum seekers rather than the United States. Um, so using different sort of coercive tactics, uh, President Trump convinced various countries um, to sign those agreements. Um, and then, if you recall as well, there were a number of different, um, uh, I don't know, what, uh, I, the, so this particular picture is of the Migration Protection Protocols, the MPP program. Um, so this was another tactic, tactic that President Trump used whereby individuals applying for asylum at the U.S. border, at sort of a port of entry, would be told, no, no, you have to wait in Mexico until you have your turn in court to determine whether you're actually a refugee. But, you know, the, the, with the backlog of uh, our U.S. asylum system um, and the situation along the border in Mexico, this was, of course, asking people to wait indefinitely in very dangerous circumstances. And uh, another tactic put in place by President, uh, President Trump, but uh, kept in place by President Biden, uh, you've probably heard of Title 42, which is you know, on the grounds of public health, um, also not allowing people or sort of immediately expelling them back to Mexico from the US when basically they're just asking for asylum. Um, which again, it is a right. So that's you know, under our own domestic law, but also under international law, uh, people have the right to at least ask for asylum and then to have their claims assessed. So all of these uh, tactics seem pretty similar, right, to some of the tactics that we've seen in the European Union. Um, so briefly, you know, maybe on possibly a more hopeful note, I'll just talk about a few important thoughts, I think. Nothing too conclusive here, but just some things to think about. So I, I find this very interesting. So this is from, this is a Gallup poll, and they've been polling on the issue of how Americans feel about migration um, since 1965. And for the first time in 2020, Gallup found that more Americans want more migration than want less migration, which is pretty, which is pretty remarkable, right? In terms of what you hear about migration in our news media, in terms of what you think that Americans feel about migration. But when you look at the, the wide population of voters, people actually feel pretty okay about migration. They actually even, the majority, or the, at least the largest number, uh, percentage, really even actually want more. But again, you won't see this reflected, I think, in the, in the discourse we have from the news media and from politicians on this issue. 
Um, another issue I think is important to know is the way we talk about migration, the way we talk about asylum seekers. So just as a random sample of recent headlines, from honestly from across the news spectrum, what, you know, not depending whether uh, a newspaper or um, news source is more, more uh, conservative or more liberal, but just, just to read a few of them. So the first is, Germany, Poland, bolster borders and a migrant surge from Belarus. Um, another one here, migrants arrived in droves. This poor New Mexico city opened its arms. And then in the subheading, it also talks about an influx of migrants. Um, and then lastly, this heading says, Spain says flood of migrants from Morocco is serious crisis. So in all of these articles, you might ask yourself, if you see a headline like this, how many people are they actually talking about? Right, so in some cases, this is a few thousand people. And in the context of large countries, it's not necessarily a crisis, right? Until you see these, this continued use of water metaphors when we talk about migrants. So why is it always a flood? Why is it droves? Why is it a surge? Right? Are, are we, you know, how, how much is sensationalism versus actual numbers that back up the use of that kind of language? And I think in all of these cases, we could as easily talk about an increase in arrivals, but that doesn't sound as exciting, right? Or as scary, because all of these types of words make you feel frightened, and that's, that's sort of the intended effect. So if we're reading, I think at least as consumers, if nothing else, we can be conscious of, of the use of that type of language when talking about people. Okay, another issue, you know, a way that countries of the global north can help sort of rebalance that pressure that's put on countries of the global south, which again are doing most of the migrant and refugee hosting, um, is through resettlement. So refugee resettlement is a bit different from asylum seekers arriving at our southern border, for example, right? So refugee resettlement involves bringing people who have already qualified as refugees in the countries in which they're living and bringing them to the United States to live here permanently as you know, permanent residents. Um, and historically, we've been a leader on this issue uh, as the US. So you know, for years, we were the country in the world resettling the largest number of refugees. And then that steadily declined, as you can see in this graph, under the Trump presidency. And President Biden has promised to bring that number up, um, but did not follow through on his promise so far for, for the previous fiscal year, fiscal year 2021. Um, has promised to do it for fiscal year 2022, but it's an issue to watch. <laughs> because I think that's another area where we can lead again. And you know, refugee resettlement, I mean, migration can be very contentious, I understand, within domestic politics, but refugee resettlement uh, prior, to the, prior to the Trump presidency was not so contentious. This was really a bipartisan issue. And especially on certain aspects of resettlement, you know, there's overwhelming support across the political spectrum. So the, the resettlement of, Af of Afghan evacuees um, a few months ago was one issue where you, know, you saw overwhelming support for this across the political spectrum, right? And I think in many ways, I and mean, we can talk about it in the Q&A if people want, but you know, in many ways it was seen as a disaster. <laughs> and I think that, sorry, the, the evacuation at Kabul airport um, I think we could have done more, like I think we could have gotten more people out if we had acted earlier, and which is what refugee advocates have been asking for from the Biden administration. But nonetheless, I think it's also an important demonstration of when we see an issue as important, we can act with a lot of capacity and a lot of, in, in a quick time period, right? So if we prioritize refugee resettlement globally, not, not, not just Afghans, although we should prioritize Afghans too, but if we prioritize this issue area, it's an, it's an area where we can really ramp up our capacity Um, important to note, though, on the issue of Afghans, that you know, the, while, while so much focus was on the Kabul airport and getting people out within that closing window, um, the majority of Afghans did not come to the U.S. Via, via that mechanism, right? So most, as has happened in previous iterations of Afghan displacement, most people are going to end up in Pakistan and in Iran. So another way that we can support Afghans beyond just resettling people to the United States is to support the countries that are hosting them but doing so in a way to make sure that countries are not just putting in place sort of, you know, allegedly um, welcoming policies to Afghans without making sure that that aid is actually going to where it needs to go. So sort of holding countries like Pakistan or Iran to account, but also making sure that we're supporting the countries that are doing the most work in terms of hosting refugees. And I'd like to end presentations with this last note. It's, it's related to this topic, but you have to think sort of a little bit broader, a little bit abstract. So when we think about global migration, I think we should consider this, this image. So basically, I don't know if you can see well, but basically the areas that are highlighted in green 
um, represent countries of the global north. I know that's counterintuitive in the, in the case of Australia, but um, if we think about countries where 73% of the world's income is located, that's all the countries in green, right? And just 14% of the world's population lives there. If we look at, and you notice the little red lines, those are the very fortified borders. <laughs> Some of the ones we're talking about in, in, in Europe, you can see, you know, part of Morocco, part of Europe's eastern border, um, part of sort of countries south of Morocco, um, Mauritania, Senegal, um, and our own US, uh, our own border with Mexico, of course. Um, and then the countries in gray, countries of the global south, you know, that's 86% of the world's population and just 27% of the world's income. So when we think about migration, it's also a way to deal with this severe inequality. Right? And this economic inequality is also mapped onto um, citizenship inequality. So the country that you're born into is the largest determinant of the life opportunities that you'll have. Um, there's, no other, there's no other qualifier. And so migration is one way to help <laughs> rectify some of this citizenship inequality and this economic inequality. Um, so just something to keep in mind, I guess, as you continue to read about migration and refugee issues. Uh, going forward. All right, I'll stop there, and I'm uh, very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. No, okay. Earrings and masks don't go together well. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Kelsey, for a very interesting talk. And now we have some time for questions. I'm just curious how, how Russia fits into all of this. Uh, in terms of its hosting of minorities or sending and, people? And, and in the, in the uh, involvement in any of the worldwide opinion? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I gave a, a talk a couple weeks ago at the World Affairs Council, and someone had a similar question about China. <laughs> yeah. And I think about both these countries as very powerful countries that are sort of outliers when it comes to the world refugee. Right, and I think it's interesting too when we think about conversations about um, you know rising superpowers and who's going to have a say. And it's not to say that these countries are not involved in some of the sort of UN level administration of like the UNHCR, for example. China's involved with that. I, I actually don't know if Russia is, but nonetheless, I think these are countries that could have that could come to play a big role in refugee administration as they sort of grow in prominence. Um, but I'm not sure what their their approach would be, whether it would match that of you know Western liberal democracies, or it might be something entirely different. And, and as of now, from what I understand, they're primarily sort of economic supporters, if anything, of institutional organizations like the UNHCR, rather than directly involved in like refugee resettlement. And you know, same goes for, for China. So maybe that will change going forward as countries like the United States and others continue to, if they continue to sort of stand back from this issue. Um, but as of right now, they, you know, yeah, Russia has not been highly involved in, in sort of the global infrastructure of the refugee regime. Thank you. I, uh, I'm having to do some reorienting and everything. I always figured the difference between the global south and the global north is defined by the equator. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And the, uh, but I see we've got a shifting border here. Hmm. Between so for you, yeah. What defined global south as yeah. opposed to global north? Great question. So it's true. I, I use these terms um, without necessarily explaining them. So for me, so I think within within academia, maybe it hasn't translated so much outside. But talking about the global north and global south became sort of another way of talking about the developed world and the underdeveloped world, as those terms kind of fell out of favor. Um, and it, and the difference is that you know I think those other terms lesser developed or you know undeveloped countries really is talking about like the country's GDP, its level of economic development. And the global north, global south tries to get at, maybe it's more of a political science term because it tries to get at these power structures. So which countries are powerful, whether that's through economic power or other sorts of you know soft power, in, uh, international power that they might hold within the international system versus countries that have uh, historically had less power within that system. So you can also kind of think about it as like the former colonial world and post-colonial world, right? That might be another interchangeable term. Well, when, when, when you're going to speak, then I guess academically or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I uh, 
is this a, a sort of a shifting border or something between in terms what's of global north and what's global south? Yeah, I mean, if you look here, it doesn't, you're right, it doesn't quite follow hemispheres, right? That's right. <laughs> it's more about which countries are sort of powerful in the international system. But there's a whole lot more north of the equator mm -hmm. than That's south true. of the equator That's true. in all dimensions. And so uh, I was curious. Yeah, no, it's an interesting observation. Um, and I think, you know, even that term gets, gets challenged because, well, how do we think about countries that are, it, it, painting it as this black and white picture is not necessarily helpful either, right? Because as the question previously asked about Russia or Brazil or other countries that are, you know, somewhat powerful, right, and, and gaining an economic prominence as well, um, but might still sort of fit better within that global south box. But maybe, it, it, I mean, just having a dichotomy is also not always helpful, right? So there's lots of sort of gray areas in between that as well. But yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so to be sure I understand, global north and global south are common academic terms. Yeah, at least in my at least in the field of political science, international relations. You know, I read it in news articles now too, so maybe it's kind of finding its way outside of outside of. I think one is about Brazil too. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Again, it's it's not always a good idea to, to dichotomize things, but sometimes it is helpful to talk about some like pretty stark differences. Thank you. Um, to bring this up a little bit more locally, to even a Houston level, I currently uh, work with many of the agencies in Houston's Refugee Resettlement Consortium. Oh, wonderful. Uh, to try and ensure access to health care, at the very least primary care. Mm -hmm. So while among that consortium, there's overwhelming support for raising the ceiling of accepting refugees and migrants, mm -hmm. the common question that we've been discussing is how do we fortify mm -hmm. the resettlement agencies to be able to accommodate so that once the larger population of refugees is here, yeah. we are able to properly integrate them and empower them in our communities. Right. So I just wanted your opinion from your experience internationally with NGOs and um, international governments if you had any insights into that. Well, I mean, you're probably, honestly, you're probably going to have more insights than I do because <laughs> you're so highly involved in this sector. Um, but from what I understand, uh, it, so just to provide, I guess, more context for anyone who's not as familiar, under the Trump administration, because we resettled so few refugees, there was a lot less federal money coming into refugee resettlement agencies that work in, in cities like Houston, but really across the country. And then suddenly, with the sudden arrival of a large number of Afghans, uh, resettlement agencies were asked to basically just quickly step up, right, even though they'd had to deal with years of having to let people go, or having to look for alternative sources of funding, or having to deal with just not having as, as many people coming, and thus not as much uh, financial capacity. Um, but, I mean, I would hope that in, in raising the ceiling and actually following, so the ceiling refers to like the, the maximum number of refugees that would be resettled in a particular year, but in order to actually meet that ceiling and to get that many people here, um, we of course need uh, capacity both internationally but also on the ground. So it involves people, um, basically organizations that the government contracts to who are the ones that go around to countries like Egypt, Morocco, and Turkey, other countries in the global south to um, you know further vet refugees to make sure that they're uh, not any kind of security threat or you know, that they have to go through like a health process, a health um, assessment, other ways to make sure that they're ready to come to the United States. So also those uh, agencies need to be restocked and refunded as well, in addition to the organizations that meet people once they're actually in the United States and then help them uh, manage and, and get by in the first few months and you know even years um, while they're living in the United States. So I mean, I would hope that, and I know there's people advocating for this um, to, to the Biden administration now, um, not only to raise the number of people coming, but also to you know, fortify the organizations here that are doing all the work on the ground. So I, I agree that it needs to have that one can't have one without the other. Do you think that there could be some push for leadership on the state level that would be helpful? I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can try. <laughs> you can try. I don't. I don't know what to say about that. I'm a relatively new Texan, and uh, I know this is a very contentious issue in, in Texas. But you know, ultimately, it is a federally funded program. So I would say that the better chance for appeal is probably there. Um, 
one of the things I can say is that they just decided to allow, in sort of a model that Canada uses for refugee resettlement, they just decided to allow for local sponsorship of individuals. So normally, um, the NGOs that are the resettlement agencies are responsible for providing like, initial funding for individuals and helping them get oriented once they arrive. And now, I guess we're going to start experimenting with a model whereby groups of individuals can come together and decide to resettle or to host someone to resettle and to be responsible for them the first few months while they're here. And it's, so it's private sponsorship, a uh, private sponsorship model, and that's something that Canada's been doing since 2014 or 2015, since the, since the, um, uh, the Europe's crisis basically in response to Syria. So I don't know a lot about how it will work in the U.S., but I think it's a really interesting um, move that we're doing. Sorry. Do you, yeah, please go. I'm with Austin, but the reason I ask that is because though it's, like you said, federal dollars that are going to this resettlement, in 2016, sort of almost at the height of the crisis, mm -hmm. Abbott defunded, to some extent, refugee resettlement. Mm -hmm. So not said that we Texas specifically wouldn't accept all of the federal dollars that was mm. was allowed. So that's just kind of why I feel yeah. like I wanted to discuss the pressures that we can put. Have you have you done, been involved in any advocacy at the state level since the Biden administration came into uh, me? I, po politics is an application only of mine. So <laughs> almost so really not personally, but I work very closely with those who do. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the resettlement agencies here are doing in terms of state strategy now that there's a different federal uh, position, but I, I would be curious to learn more too. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. In, in, the, long, in the long term, uh, refugees and country borders, and for instance, Jordan has had a long history of having Palestinians. Yes. Have they created, have they been able to have a vote, uh, political, uh, Activities in their countries as they go in, and yeah. the that? That's a really good question. So, uh, Jordan is not a country I, I study specifically, but I do know others who do and have read their work, so I'm going off of that. But um, there's, there's basically like multiple tiers of citizenship for, for Palestinians uh, in Jordan, depending on when they came and depending on um, sort of a number of other factors. So, basically, I think there's ended up being at least three, if not more, sort of tiers of. You know, full citizenship, more like a sort of identity card, um, and those who basically don't have any kind of citizenship in the state. I, I was actually talking about countries you had studied. Do you see movement in those countries to allow those refugees to be permanent to, residents? To gain citizenship or things yeah. like that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so in, uh, in Turkey, for example, some Syrians, like quite a, a small number, um, a few thousand, were offered citizenship. Uh, primarily a sort of a political move uh, because, you know, Erdogan sees these individuals as potential future voters for the AKP party. Um, but predominantly, no. Predominantly this is, you know, it, it actually really depends on also the individual's background. So there's sort of um, possibilities maybe for citizenship and uh, if, if an individual is coming from an Arab country, uh, versus a Saharan African country, for example, um, and for example, for women, um, it would be much uh, if they were to marry an Egyptian citizen, for example, they could uh, eventually, like let's say, a Syrian woman was able to marry an Egyptian uh, man, she could eventually gain citizenship, but it wouldn't work in reverse. So uh, a Syrian man marrying an Egyptian woman would not be able to transfer her or be able to obtain citizenship. So there's a lot of nuance, um, but predominantly across the board. These countries that I've studied are not looking to to offer citizenship to refugees and migrants. And you know, I think as you maybe implied with your question, a lot of that has to do with historical understandings of the Palestinian displacement in the region and how long people ended up staying. I think there's a real fear to integrate fully um, migrants and refugees um, with you know potential political impacts domestically. So and even with Syrians arriving in other countries like in Jordan or Lebanon. Um, that did host Palestinians previously, there was, a, there was an, an emphatic um, uh, no in terms of uh, those countries' willingness to allow for sort of de facto integration of Syrians um, because of the historical experience of hosting Palestinians and how long. Obviously, that's going on for now. Um, so this is like a, a quick example. I did some field work in Lebanon in 2017 I remember a UN officer, a UNDP officer, telling me that 
Um, a lot of Syrians live in the Bakaw Valley, which is near the border with Syria, right? So it's an area where there's a lot of informal tent and settlements. They're not, they're not camps. They're basically just sort of informal structures where a lot of Syrians are living. And um, these tent, these informal tent and settlements were not allowed in this area to hook up to local sewer lines or, or sewage lines um, or water, water mains because that would imply some kind of permanent settlement. Right? So instead, the UNDP was trucking water from Beirut up and over the mountains into the Bacaw, you know, just like several hour journey through mountains, um, just because the local governments and the, the national government wouldn't allow for any kind of you know, inclination of, of permanent uh, settlement. I hope that answers the question. That was long winded. Thanks. I have a question. I remember reading about, uh, of course, Angela Merkel letting the people in. Germany, and that one of her reasons for doing it, aside for the uh, humani humanitarian, was Germany needed more young people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, you know, when when, uh, when Merkel stepped down early this year, she was really, I feel like people were really remembering her for her handling of the Eurozone crisis and for this 2015 moment of, of Syrians arriving and really praising her. And I feel that you know she she was the one to say like we'll let them stay, and I think that was a really profound moment for Europe. But at the same time, we had this like incredible backlash yeah. just you know a few weeks months later, um, and quickly Germany and well as well as other countries defaulted to the, the types of policies that I was talking about. But um, I think that's a, a common uh, like what's the word I'm looking for a paradox I guess like all this pushback against migration. And yet, we're talking about countries that have incredibly low birth rates and where there's no, you know, where, where immigration is needed. There was a recent article in the Chronicle, Stan Merrick, a local construction company guy, was giving a talk at A&M to students who were planning to go into construction business. And he said, well, unless you're planning to hang the sheetrock yourself, you better write your Congress members. Mm -hmm. Because in, just, riding my bike around my neighborhood and a lot of construction sites and then all of them say all espanol and if you threw the immigrants out of houston it would come to a screeching halt the other thing i read was that when you showed the, the graph showing the increase in acceptance of, of migration that the problem is not that it's that with like certain issues the antis are so extreme and so loud that they take over the whole uh, space, media space. Because Texas was not anti, I grew up here, and it really wasn't severely anti-immigrant. George W. Bush yeah. was not, not at all. Yeah. I think it's been a recent change in attitude. Yes, I mean, if you look at, I remember seeing conversations between George, uh, George George Bush Sr. and I can't remember now who he was debating, but at the time, uh, the discussion over immigration sounds like you know quite left-wing people talking about it now, <laughs> and the conversation has just shifted so drastically in those three decades. Um, and so I, that's I mean part of what I'm curious about and what I was trying to maybe get out in the last bit of the presentation was what are the strategies we can use to sort of depoliticize an issue, right? when it doesn't actually really necessarily reflect the empirical reality on the ground or this idea of crisis, um, how do we sort of de-crisis de a situation or de-politicize de a situation, right? And I, I, I don't know the big answer, but I was hoping to talk about at least some like little bits and pieces we can all do. Maybe talk to the psychology department? <laughs> well, thank you very much. And now we're going to offer some books three copies that Dr. Norman has kindly signed, and I will pick these out at random, not looking, and if it's not someone who's here, I'll draw again until it is somebody who's here. Raven Jones, Mr. Chance. Bassam to